I'd like to say good morning to each one that's listening to us via Facebook. We're still not having church, and uh, right now, the way everything's looking, we're calling church until further notice. I do ask everybody to just continue praying as I pray for you all. Uh, the benches are empty, but uh, yet I can look around and see where people sit. I guess we all want to have it sitting about the same place so many times, but uh, God's still good to us, and he blesses us to keep going. And uh, we need to pray this morning that the uh, Lord will help us to get through this. And uh, God's still on the throne. Amen. And he's still real. He's the Almighty. And he's the one to be praised. I tell you, you look over there in the Psalms, and I read this morning. It says, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And just keep on praise of God, because he's worthy. He created the heavens and earth and everything that we enjoy, the fellowship that we have in our church. And yet it's sort of strange, but still yet I think of it. And I pray that you're all praying for one another. Amen. And as we pray this morning, let's uh, pray for Brother Mike uh, Powers. He's not doing good. Remember Teresa, too. She's going through this with him. And also uh, Hunter and Danielle, I hear they're getting better. And uh, all the needs in our church. Let's just pray for each other. Pray for Brother Andy. She'll be uh, bringing the word. Pray for the leaders of our nation. And those on the front line, so many doctors and nurses are getting sick. And uh, uh, policemen, just different ones. You just never know. You just don't see it coming. But God's able to take care of us, whether it's here in this life or you know, we get to go on home to be with Jesus. That's what we're looking forward to. And I just encourage you all to just keep keep it on. Keep Amen. living for the Lord. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you as we come to you this morning. Lord, we just ask you just to be with us here as we're uh, going out over Facebook. Lord, just help it to work that uh, people can... Uh, uh, Hear your word, and we'll hear more people being saved, Lord. They'll come and know Christ as their personal Savior, Lord. He's, Christ is still in the saving business here in 2020, Lord. We live in such a modern time, but yet we're in desperate need of your help, God. We just look to you to help us in these needs. Just bless the sick in our church, Lord. We just pray you just reach out and touch them, Lord. Just uh, touch their bodies and heal them, Lord. Just, Bless Brother Eddie as he stands to preach your word, Lord, as given the words we need of, Lord. Help us all us to hide in our hearts, Lord. We might not sin against you, and we'll grow closer to you, Father. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for uh, sending your son there and died on that rugged cross that we can have life and have it more abundantly, and we have a home there in heaven waiting for us, Lord. Just uh, help each one out there, Lord. Bless the leaders of our nation, Lord, and those on the front lines, Lord, and the doctors and nurses, those doing research to find a cure, Lord, just help them, Lord, and just give them knowledge, wisdom, and strength, Father. We uh, thank you, Lord, for being so good to us each and every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll turn it over to Brother Eddie. Well, it is good to be able once again this morning to come, I guess, many of you into your homes, and some of you may be at other places and other folks' home and, and listening in by the way of Facebook this morning, and I guess that's the way a lot of services are being conducted right now uh, around in our area and probably across our nation this morning. But we're thankful for the technology that we have today to be able to to do this, if it wasn't for that, then we wouldn't be able to have church like we're doing today. And uh, of course, we're right here at uh, at the Adwolf Free Will Baptist Church and behind the pulpit of the Adwolf Church. And uh, coming uh, your way to, to have a church service this morning that we can worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. And we're certainly thankful again that we're able to do that. And we'd uh, just like to... to uh, uh, say good morning uh, to all of our Adwolf uh, church family uh, that are listening in this morning. Trust that God is just uh, uh, 
blessing you and, and watching over you and keeping you safe uh, through these very uh, trying and difficult times that we're going through. And then others, we uh, looked uh, last week at some that had, had listened in, that tuned in to Facebook, and some folks back over in the North Carolina area uh, are, are uh, uh, tuning in to Facebook and listening to the uh, service here at the church as well. We, we're thankful that you're doing that and welcome you uh, to the church service here at Adwolf this morning. And uh, we just want us all to be able to uh, to worship the Lord together. And uh, as Brother Gary said, uh, uh, we can praise the Lord, lift up the name of the Lord together. And you say, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not all that uh, an emotional type person. You may not be, uh, but we can still praise the Lord this morning. And, and uh, you know, the last five chapters in the book of Psalms all begin and end the same way. I don't know if you've ever looked at that and noticed that or not. The Psalms 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150 begin and end with praise ye the Lord. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to lift up his name in praise and thanksgiving. And uh, uh, we want you to turn, if you, if you have your Bibles and have them handy, and I trust that each one does, because this, again, is uh, just our, our regular service uh, here at the church, and we're not able to assemble ourselves together, and that's certainly what the Hebrew writer instructed us to do, is to not, in, in these latter days especially, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And obviously it was going on even in the time that the Hebrew writer wrote that, because he said, as the manner of some is. So it was already existing that folks were forsaking and staying away from church. And he said, don't do that. You assemble, you be in the house of the Lord. Well, right now we're unable to do that, but we're assembling together uh, by this means and by this avenue together. And so we can worship the Lord as one in the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, the church is, is not this building that we're in anyway. That's just a structure that has been built. It's been dedicated to the Lord, and we know that. But uh, it's just a building. And if the building was not here, then the church still exists. The body of believers make up and comprise the church. So you may be in different areas, different locations. Some of you may have come together this morning. Whichever means you're doing that to listen by the way of Facebook, we're assembling together by that means to worship the Lord together this morning. So that's the only means that and Brother Gary said, we, we hope this thing comes to an end as soon as possible. But as of right now, looks like church services will have to be delayed even further. We don't know how far out, how long that is going to be. But I will assure you, if the good Lord blesses us with hell, then on Sunday morning, we're going to be here. And we're going to be bringing you a message from the Word of God to try to help you encourage us and get us through these trying times and of course we we thought originally that last sunday and this sunday would be the only two sundays that would be on facebook so we hadn't made a whole lot of plans and planned ahead but we're going to try to get together a, a little more and work on that and have some singing even some uh, play some music or have somebody coming in and doing some singing and kind of just further just a little bit our church service here on Sunday morning. Now, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn in, into the book of Psalms, chapter number 37 this morning. The book of Psalms, chapter number 37, 40 verses in this chapter. And, uh, you know, most of the time I, I don't read through a whole chapter. And I certainly wouldn't want to try to preach through a whole chapter, and I guess you'd probably be glad of that. But um, uh, we want to read it all because it is it is so meaningful. I, I believe, uh, as I read it, and I, I read it yesterday, I got up this morning, I went back and read it again. 
I read all the commentary footnotes from the Bible that I could find and, and just let it speak to my heart and the satisfying psalms that there is in the Bible, 150 psalms, uh, many of which, the majority of which was written by David, and this one, of course, written by David as well. Uh, but I, I believe it's one of the most satisfying of all the psalms and one probably one of the most satisfying passages that there is in the Word of God. And when you find yourself in times like that which we're going through right now, take your Bible, go into the book of Psalms, and just begin to read them and, and let them speak to your heart and let them comfort your soul because I'm sure that they will. Now, David is writing this psalm in his old age. In fact, verse 25 makes mention of that. that David said he was, had been young and now he was old. So in the latter stages of his life, he began to write this psalm right here. And he's reflecting back on his life and what God's done for him and then passes some mighty good advice along to us. And I want you to listen to that advice that David gives to us as we read this this morning. So David's not looking ahead and saying, I trust that God will do this. Of course, David's always trusting God, and I hope that we're always doing that. But David is looking back on life and saying, hey, here's what God did for me and in and around my life. And uh, I believe it's a great encouragement to us this morning. Now, one of the things that we always do uh, at church and uh, that is we, we, and the reason that I ask folks to do this, Ezra the scribe uh, began to read from the word of God uh, to a people that had been so long away from the word of God in, in, in captivity. And now uh, the word of God is, is coming back and becoming real in their life again. And when Ezra, the Bible said they made a pulpit, and Ezra stood on that pulpit above the people, and he opened the word of God, and they had become so hungry because they hadn't heard it in so long uh, that the people stood as the word of God was being read. So I'm not going to, you know, I can't see you this morning. You can see me, but I can't see you. But I'm going to ask you right there where you're at, if you can, and if you're able, and if you sitting back in the recline or recline back. You probably don't want to do this, but if you can, let's just stand and, and read the word of God together. Can we do that? The Bible said in verse one, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now listen as David begins to uh, share some things with us that will strengthen us today. David said, trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the as the noon day. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is come. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of an upright conversation. Their swords shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. 
A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, and the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed of the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, and to smoke shall they consume away. The wicked barreth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and am now old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. Amen to that. Yeah. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and in his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land where the wicked are cut off. Thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he cannot be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright for him, that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Father, we're thankful today that you have made this avenue of us being able to worship together possible for us this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the good news from last Sunday morning and the efforts that were put forth in this service of, of one being saved because of that. And Lord, we rejoice in that. And I, I give you thanks and I give you praise for, uh, Lord, the word of God reaching a heart and helping them to see and to understand their need of a Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for saving individuals still that call upon you. Now, as the folks from Admiral Frill Baptist Church and others that are listening this morning, as we assemble together to worship you, Lord, would you speak to our hearts in a very special way. And Lord, I know this is, is not the same as we're accustomed to doing when we come together in the house of God, but Lord, still all this week, I've looked so forward to this opportunity to be able to minister to the needs of folks this morning. So I pray right now, Lord, would you just get right in close to the individuals and the hearts of those that are listening today. Encourage those that are discouraged. Heal, Lord, we pray if it be your will, those that are sick this morning. And those that, Lord, that are down and out and, and some, I don't know, I hope they're not ready to quit and give up, but Lord, if they are, would you just reassure them that everything's still all right in the, in the sight of God today? And that you're still on the throne and you're still in control of all things. And Lord, if we'll just learn to do like David said, trust in the Lord, wait on the Lord. And as the passage of Scripture said, lean not to our own understanding, but all thy ways to acknowledge you. And Lord, may we do that this morning. So right now, speak through us as your servant to the listeners this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. 
and amen. And if you stood, and uh, then you can be seated there, and, and let's look at what the Lord has to say to us this morning. Four things that I want you to notice from this psalm this morning. First of all, David tells us to fret not. In verse number one, he said, fret not thyself because of evildoers. And in verse number seven, he said, fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. And verse number eight, he said, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. I got out the Webster's Dictionary yesterday afternoon, last night when I was sitting around and uh, sitting at my desk and doing some more study in preparation for this message this morning. And I looked up the word fret in Webster's Dictionary. And there were several definitions, but I kind of picked out the ones that I think would fit for the message this morning. They all, all kind of went along together, but I didn't jot them all down. But here's what Webster's Dictionary defines the word fret. It says to eat away or to gnaw, to wear away by gnawing or corroding, to be irritated, annoyed, or quarrelous. And the last word that it mentioned in that list of definitions for the word fret was this, worry. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, and I, I want to get back on it maybe just a minute or two as we go through this uh, particular section of the message, but I found it interesting that uh, uh, fret and worry are kind of kin, if you would. They kind of go hand in hand. They go together. And this psalm, if you look at it, gives us two reasons why people fret. David said we fret because we've become surprised a lot of times at the mysterious prosperity of the wicked in our land. Verse 7 tells us that. And the psalm uh, even tells us why we're not to fret over their prosperity. Look at it in verse number 2. It said, for they shall be cut down. In verse number 9, it says the evildoers shall be cut off. And in verse number 28, it says, For the Lord loved the judge and forsaken not his saints, they are preserved forever. Listen, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. And uh, verse number 20 says that they also, that they shall perish. Here's what David, I believe, is trying to tell us. He says, Why envy a person? that's going to spend an eternity in the awful place of hell separated from God. Why would you go through life envying somebody like that? Folks, I, you know, Job came to the conclusion we brought nothing into this world. We can definitely carry nothing out of this world and still blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Job realized that when everything else was gone, when his family had been taken away from him, his wealth was gone, all of his livestock was gone, God was still right there. Didn't matter if everything else was gone, he could still bless the name of the Lord. So we see people that, you know, they're not living for the Lord and they're not Christians that they might prosper in this life better than we do. But listen, we're rich beyond measure. In fact, this passage said, you know, we're rich if we know the Lord. We're richer than all the materialistic things that man can have and possess in this life. Then secondly, David said, you're surprised that the world hates you. Look down in verse number 12. It says, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. Verse 32 uh, says this. It says, The wicked watches the righteous and seeketh to slay him. If you look back over in the book of Jeremiah, and I, I and looked at the chapter and meant to jot that down, uh, exactly the chapter and verse that that is in. But Jeremiah asked the same question that some of you may ask this morning. Why doth the way of the wicked prosper? Jeremiah, what he's asking is for justice to be rendered. And I think in, in, in God's response to Jeremiah's question, no doubt was a good one. And many of you may have said, why do the wicked prosper? 
prosperous so well. And sometimes God's people just strive and struggle to get along. Why is it like that? And Jeremiah was actually asking that justice might be re rendered. And God comes back, I believe, in essence and a roundabout way and reminds Jeremiah, hey, it was my grace and my mercy that came to you. I, when you should have uh, gotten justice and you deserve justice, and if I'd have meted out justice upon you, uh, man, <laughs> it wouldn't have been so good. But he said, Jeremiah, I extended you mercy and grace. And God still extends mercy and grace to a lost and a dying world today. Man, aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful of that? But God says, in the end, I'll be the final judge. So just wait and trust in the Lord. Remember what David said? Wait on the Lord. You remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Most of you probably do. Elkanah. Uh, it's a story about Elkanah and his two wives, Penina and Hannah. Man's already in trouble right there, eh? I mean, that, that's enough to make stuff. But the, the story says this, Penina had been uh, uh, able to bear children to Elkanah, and Hannah was barren. And the Bible says that Hannah took every opportunity available to her, her to antagonize Hannah over her barrenness. Verse 6 says, and her adversary also provoked her sore to make her fret. There's that word fret again. Because the Lord had shut up her womb. But in spite of her desperation, in spite of the despair that Hannah was in, she just kept right on going to church and she kept right on praying. She could, she could have given in to the adversary and surrendered and said, it's just not worth it to trust God. But Hannah said, I may be barren as, today, as of today. My adversary might be coming against me so every day. But she said, I'm not going to quit going to church and I'm not going to quit praying. And I thought, you know, that's not what most folks do in this day and time. Uh, today, when we get blue and depressed, we'll quit reading our Bible. And I want to encourage you. While you're away from church, and, and, and we ought to have been doing this all along, but stay in the book, stay in the Word. There is more comfort in this book than there is in any newspaper or magazine or any article that you'll ever pick up. If you want to find comfort for your soul, get in the book, so stay in the Bible. Then folks will quit praying. Folks, if there's ever been a time we ought to get serious for, with God and begin to pray in earnest, it is in the hour that we're living in right now. And uh, in the book of James, James reminds us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's get serious with God. Let, let's get into the throne room of God. Let's uh, approach the throne room of Almighty God and, and not come in fear or trembling, but remember, we have a great high priest seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I. You say, who is that preacher? That's none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he came, he suffered on the cross, he died, he was buried, he arose again, he ascended back into the heavens, and today he is seated there at the right hand of God, our Father, and is interceding on my behalf and your behalf. Then folks quit going to church. Well, we can't come to church right now, per se, here in the house of God, but we're having church, and folks Remember the church and pray for one another in these times that we're going to lift one another up to God in prayer. And I think we ought to do that uh, for our church family all along and every day. So Hannah kept on reading the Bible and kept on praying and kept going to church. And I'm going to ask you this. Who turned out the best, Hannah or Penina? In the early part of 1 Samuel, we would have envied Penina. She seemed to have everything going her way. But God remembered Hannah, and Samuel was born to Hannah. It turned out all right. Trusting in God doesn't turn out bad, does it? turns out all right. Psalm 37 gives us a sure cure for fretting. Look at verse 3. 
underline these four verses or five right here, whatever that they are. Verse three says, David said, trust in the Lord. Verse four, David said, delight thyself also in the Lord. Verse five, he said, commit thy way unto the Lord. In verse seven, he says, rest in the Lord. And in verse 34, David reminds us to wait on the Lord. Boy, I need to learn that, don't you? Amen. I need to learn it a little more every day. Lord, help me to learn to wait on you. God's got everything in control. God can already see tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen next week and next month and on down the road. Anything that happens in and around our land, it's not going to surprise God. He already sees it. And God's not going to have to go before a council in heaven and say, wait a minute. This thing's got all out of hand down there in, in the United States and around the world. We're going to have to have another conference call. And we're going to have to see what we're going to do. Listen, God knew before the pandemic ever came to our country or any place around this world that it was coming. And God already knows when it's going to end. God knows exactly how still to take care of his children today. So let me encourage you. Just rest in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Commit your ways to the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, Isaiah says this, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. God help me to learn to wait. I want to do like that, don't you? I want to run and not be weary. I can't do that today. But what if I learn to trust in the Lord spiritually, spiritually speaking, I can run and not be weary. As we said a minute ago, fret, uh, fretting is akin to worry. And in Matthew chapter 6, we, we talked a little bit about this a uh, couple Sundays ago, I think it was, but I, I just want to, I'm going to talk all about that this morning that we talked about before. But Jesus reminds the people, he said, you don't need to take thought for your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink for your body, what you should put on. You don't have to worry about the eating or the drinking, the clothing. He said, the fowls of the air, they sow not, and they, neither do they reap, nor they don't gather in the barns. And Jesus said, get your heavenly Father, feed of them. And notice what he said. While God made the fowls of the air, and, and no doubt God loves them, and we'll notice in a minute that he attends the funeral of a bird when it dies. But he said, are you not much better than they? And he tells us in verse 27, worry does you no good to begin with because who taking thought can add a cubit to his stature? So worries, you, you know, you may do it, but there's no profit from it. And he says, who of you can, uh, uh, by taking thought for raiment and said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, and neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And he said, Wherefore, if God should clothe the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his rights, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I like verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. I remember when I was growing up, mom and dad had a little thing over the door when we go out. And it said this, the today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Boy, how true that little statement is. Fretting, as we said, is a kid to worry. Six ways to break the worry hat. Let me give them to you. You might want to jot them down. First of all, keep busy. Stay active. That's right. And idle mind is the devil's workshop. When your mind becomes idle, you begin to thinking of all the things that are going on around you. Stay busy. Don't let that happen. Secondly, don't let the little things in life bug you. 
God's got all those in control as well as the big bunch. And then thirdly, think of this, 90% of what you worry about will never happen anyway. So why worry about something that will never mature in your life? Fourth, cooperate with the inevitable. The late Dean Hawks of Columbia University took a mother goose rhyme as one of his mottos. It said, for every ailment under the sun, there is a remedy, though there is none. If there be one, try to find it. If there be none, never mind it. Right. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Mother goose rhyme that kind of fits. No, well, that's, that's about as Christian as you can get right there. And fifthly, if you can't redo it, don't try it. There's some things that we have had happen in our past that we can't change. We can ask God to forgive us and move on and forget about the past and look ahead and go on. But if you can't undo that that's been done already in the past, then don't try to do it. Just go on. And then sixthly, once you've done your best, there's absolutely nothing more that you can do. So why worry about it? Just do your best. Someone put it well. And they said this, forget the past, trust God to take care of the future, and live in the present. If you dwell constantly on the past, it'll worry you to death. It'll trouble you to death. And if you're always trying to take care of the future that God already has in his hand and in his control anyway, then you won't live in the present. My past has been forgotten, and I'm thankful of that. My future, God's going to take care of. And if I'll just trust God for that and forget about the past, then I can live in the present, and I trust we'll be able to do that. Second thing this morning is fear not. A great man of God once said there are two kinds of courage. There's moral courage. That is the one person, the person who would dare to do right no matter what the consequences are. Now, I want to be a good, I want to have moral courage, don't you? I want to do what's right regardless of the consequences. And then he said there's physical courage. That's when one isn't afraid of anything, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Boy, I don't have much of that. I'll be honest with you. Growing up, going to school, man, I'd rather be your buddy than to fight you. I didn't want to fight. You don't fight and you get hurt. And even if you don't get hurt around the head, you're going to tear up your knuckles trying to hurt somebody else. So who in the world would want to do that anyway? So I didn't have a lot of that physical courage and still don't have a whole lot of it today. But I'm thankful that God's given me more and more moral courage as I've gone along with my Christian life to stand for the right regardless of the consequences. You know, it's not going to go well with the world that we live in. But God will help us to have the moral courage to stand for that which is right. That fellow said it's rare when a man or a woman has both at the same time. Boy, that's probably true. There are many things that people fear. I've shared some of these with you already. A lot of people fear death. Like people, uh, Peter, some people fear men. Many fear failure. We all have a fear of trying something new. And to be honest, the older I get, the more fearful I become of trying new things. I'll be honest with you. Then many fear the minority. There's a story in the Bible, and you know this one is real well, I'm sure. And the longer that I live and the more I study the Bible, the more I grow to appreciate men like Joshua and Caleb in the Word of God. There were 12 spies to, that were sent out by Moses to spy out the land. These two men came back and had the courage of their convictions. Ten men said this, said we can't take the land. They're too big for us. They're giants down there. We look like a bunch of grasshoppers hopping around in comparison to those big giants. What they did, they saw the giants bigger than the God they served. But two of those men saw the God they served bigger than the giants that were down in the land. Now listen, you, you, can, you can allow that to happen in your life. Either your God's bigger than the giants or the giants are bigger than your God. But I thank God we've got a God that's bigger than the giants around us today. Two men, Joshua and Caleb, said along with God we can possess the land. And I thought about that. Free Baptist didn't start.
start this back a few years ago, there was a free will Baptist congregation come out of Egypt. Did you know that? They're right here. They were a good free will Baptist congregation and the majority prevailed. And because the majority prevailed, they failed to enter the promised land for 40 years. They wandered around out there in the wilderness. I thought about these other 10 spies. You ever thought how many of them might have agreed with Joshua and Caleb, but just didn't have the courage or the convictions to stand up for what they thought was right? And I've all this to which group would you have been in? Which way would you have voted? Would you have voted to go on and possess the land with the help of, the, of God? Or would you have been of those ten that said we can't take it? It's a land full of milk and honey. Here's the clusters of grapes. And it's what God said it is. But we can't have it. Or would you have been of those two that said they're big. There's a lot of them. But our God's bigger than all of them. Can you possibly imagine how lonely Noah must have felt? Here's one man that stood against not only an entire society, but an entire civilization. Yet he stood firm in the convictions that he had. We don't have a lot of Daniels today. Man that in spite of the king's edict will throw open their windows and pray. We don't have a lot of Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednego's today who would rather obey God than they would man. There's not a lot of them today. Fear is a paralyzing emotion, but listen to what I'm going to tell you right here. With God's help, it can be overcome. If you're living in constant fear or just maybe a little fear every now and then, ask God to help you to overcome that and to have the courage to go on. Then the third thing, forget not. As time goes by, we have a tendency to forget those who touched our lives for good. Sometimes it do us well to just pause and ask, who's helped me to become what I am today? And I believe if you do that, you'll quickly realize there are no self-made men, amen? Somebody has helped you and molded. And I thank God, and I, I begin to think of a few of those. And my mind went back across some of who, whom have already gone on. God's called them home to the reward. Some of them are still here. I thank God for men like Cecil Presley and, and David Nitch just right, right over the hill here. And old brother Kyle French has done gone home to be with the Lord. And Jack Sprinkle and Walter Stacher that God's called home. And your former pastor right here at the church, Bob Server. Thank God for men like that that's like left a lasting impression upon my life. Amen. You ought to stop a little while and thank God for those that have done something in your life that's helped you to become what you are today. There are a lot of things that people forget. Some people forget God. Psalms 9, 17 said the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That's why you ought to pray for America today more than you've ever prayed before. That's right. Folks, we're a nation that when we've begun, we had stamped even on our currency and on our money, and that's becoming jeopardy today. They want to go away with that. But we, we placed on there in God, we trust. We was a nation that was formed upon the, the, the biblical principles of the Word of God and how far we've gotten from that today. God help us. Right. God help us as a nation. The nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. Secondly, some people forget his blessings. Psalms 103, 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. God been good to you. Amen. Has God blessed you? Amen. <laughs> Don't you forget that. You get somewhere on your knees today. You make you an altar somewhere in your home or wherever you may be this afternoon. You give God thanks for the blessings that he's laid upon your life. If you're saved of the grace of God, if your family members are saved of the grace of God, you've got a roof over your head and food on your table and clothes on your back and shoes on your feet. Man, you're blessed beyond measure. Give God praise for that. That's right. There are a lot of Christians like old Elijah under the juniper tree and like Jonah under the gourd vine. All they want to do is sit around and gripe and complain 
about what they don't have. You know, when you start griping, complaining about you don't, what you don't have, you'll become less thankful for the things that you do have. Yeah, that's right. Stop and think about that just a minute. Then some people forget the Bible. There are many passages that commands us not only to read the Word of God, but to study the Bible. And let me say this. There are a lot of things in life that's optional. You can do them or you, you can choose not to do them. But you don't have a choice in this when it's not optional. We need to study the Word of God. Get in the book. Stay in the book. Then some people seem to forget that they're saved. At least that's the way they live. First, uh, 2 Peter 1 9 said to have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I don't ever forget that, do you? I know where I was, and I know where I could have been today. Right now, I could be in hell. And you could too, had it not been for the grace of God. Amen. Amen. I don't want to forget that one day he wrecks way below the bottom where I had sunk to and where the devil and sin had taken me to and he got to where I lived and where I was at and rescued me and picked me up out of that mire of sin, set my feet on a solid rock and established my goings. And folks, I don't ever forget that. I'll tell you, after all of these years, after all this time, I remember when the Lord breathed life into one that was dead. I remember how the Lord took somebody that was dead in their trespasses and sins and breathed life and made me whole again. Amen. Folks, don't forget that. Then the last thing, fourthly, thank God. I jotted down a lot of scriptures. <laughs> And I just want to share them with you right quickly. Second Corinthians 4, 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Yeah. Luke 18, 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Ephesians 3, 13 says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Galatians 6, 9, Paul again writes, said, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hebrews 12, 5 says, my son despise thou not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Matthew 9, 36 says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered as sheep, having no shepherd. Now, you and I both know this. Jesus isn't talking here about physical fainting. He's talking about spiritual fainting. And the Lord promises a special blessing to you and I to preserve in life. You see, it takes no talent. It takes no good looks, and thank God it doesn't. It takes no great personality to faint not. It doesn't take any of those things. You say, what are the causes of fainting, preacher? Let me right quickly give you five things. And I'm going to give you a little of the physical aspect and a little of the spiritual aspect here as well. A bad atmosphere can cause us to faint. Physically, you can get into a bad environment and it can cause you to faint. Now, the same is true spiritually. And one of the classic examples of that is when they had arrested Jesus, took him into the trial that should have never been held at the time that it was held anyway. But Peter was outside warming his hands by the wrong campfire with the wrong crowd, and he fainted spiritually and denied that he ever knew the Lord. Same man that said everybody else might forsake you, but Lord, I won't be one of them. He fainted when he got around the wrong crowd. Folks, getting around the wrong crowd, the wrong atmosphere, spiritually can cause you to faint. Then sight of blood will cause some people to faint physically. That happens. But spiritually, there was a young man that came to Jesus and he looked at the Lord and he said, what can I do that I might have eternal life? And Jesus showed him a cross and he showed him a man on that cross. Showed him blood on his face and side and his body. And the Bible said he fainted because of that and went away sorrow. Then weakness or weariness may cause a person to faint. Elijah, right after his great victory on Mount Carmel, the Bible said he jogged 17 miles to Jezreel. And then he went another day's journey off into the wilderness and he was utterly exhausted 
when he reached the juniper tree. And there at that juniper tree was a man that was weary, weakened. Uh, the condition that he was in, all of that helped Elijah to just say, God, just go ahead and let me die. Nobody's serving you. God reminded him, well, was it 7,000 over there that had not bowed the knee to Baal? God still had a remnant out there. Amen. A lot of burnout sometimes is simply feigning from weariness in life. Then a lack of food may cause you to faint. Physically, I got thinking about it. Most of us have no difficulty with this particular point right here. We're not undernourished. Thank God there's plenty to eat in this land. However, spiritually, some of you are in danger of faint. And I thought, you know, in order for a Christian not to faint, he must stand in the Word of God. I'm going to go home here in a few minutes. I'll go to my mother-in-law's house. I know she's probably listening to Deb and mother-in-law there listening. And she said, well, what do you want? I said, well, you know, we ate pancakes last Sunday morning after service. And it won't hurt me to eat them pancakes again this Sunday morning. And I'm not under nurse. I, I'm blessed and, and, and well fed. But I'm going to tell you, listen, spiritually, you become weakened when you leave the Word of God out of your life. It better be a part of your life or you're going to get weak spiritually. Then fifthly, discouragement may cause a person to fail. It's possible that you'll become so discouraged that you just want to give up. I want to encourage you something right here. Don't you do it. Don't give up. I want you to listen to this. One of the greatest promises comes out of the book of Isaiah. One of these verses I already quoted a moment ago. But it's in verse 28 of Isaiah chapter 40. Listen to what Isaiah says. He said, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not. We may faint, but he don't faint. Neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and what? And not faint. <laughs> God help us to do this, that, right? God's never discouraged. I say, say he's never discouraged. Listen, God's not discouraged today. He's never tired. He's never perplexed. God's never confused. In fact, verse 29 said, He give us power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increaseth their strength. If you need strengthening today, ask God for it. He'll give it to you. Paul reached a very difficult time, and we're about done, in his life. And he prayed that God would remove a thorn that was in his flesh. What that thorn was, I don't know, and you don't know, and if anybody tells you they know, they, they're just not giving you the full truth. And you know the reason why we don't know the Bible don't tell us. That's one of those things that God just chose to leave out. I do know this, it was in his flesh. It had something to do with this body. Some have speculated that maybe it was his eyesight where he was struck blind on the Damascus road that day. I don't know. I don't know what it is. No use me getting into that and trying to figure out something that the Bible doesn't tell me about anyway. But instead of removing the thorn, God left it there. In fact, Paul said as a messenger, Satan, that God had placed there to both of him. I believe Paul said, you know, God may not have chosen to remove it, but God used it for his glory and helped me to stay where I needed to be. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus, these are words from Christ. If you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll see it in red letters. The Lord said to Paul, he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, right. for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. And in closing this morning, the Lord tells us to fret not, fear not, forget not, and faint not. You may be fretting, you may be fearing, you may be about ready to faint. Hang in there. And I want to encourage you, don't you ever forget what the Lord's done in your life. He's done something marvelous. 
that only he could have done. And don't you forget it. Perhaps you're listening this morning. You've been worried about something or fearing some particular thing in life or taking various things for granted. Or perhaps you've reached such a level that you're in danger of this morning to throw in the towel and giving up and quitting altogether. Let me let me encourage you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Hang in there. Our country and our world right now is probably the one of the most trying times in the history of our lifetime. Now we can read about things that have happened in the past before our lifetime. But in most of our lifetime, this is probably the worst thing that has ever taken place. David said, I went through a lot in life. Saul pursued after me and hot, was hot on my heels and threatened my life. I went through a lot and endured a lot in this life. But David said, you can still trust in the Lord. You can still wait patiently for God to take care of things. Brother Gary already said this morning, thank God for the doctors and the nurses that are on the front lines trying to do everything that they can to ensure that those that get sick are brought back to, and, uh, to, to health. And then we got scientists that are working in the labs trying to come up with something to combat this, this virus that we have in our land today. You ought to be praying, as Gary did this morning, for the doctors and the nurses, those on the front line, praying for scientists that they can come up with a means. But all of us at the same time, may we just learn to trust in God more than anybody Amen. Else. Amen. May we learn to wait on the Lord. Just take all of your troubles, all your trials, all your sorrows, all your problems. Just give them to Jesus right now. He's big enough to carry. Yeah. I'm going to say something right here that you probably, if you listen to me, I don't know if I've ever said it that you've heard me, but you'll say this is the first time right here by on Facebook that you heard it this morning, but your first time that you'll probably hear it more. God's not too big, but he's not concerned about our little problems. Amen. And God's not so small that he can't help our big problems. God's interested in where you're at this morning. You know, so many times David just got down to business with God. In those Psalms, he didn't try to tell God anything that was out of the order. He just told God how he felt in life. And if you're worried, if you've got fear in your life this morning, just bring that, don't beat around. You know, a lot of times we get, we we'll go to God in prayer and for some reason we think we just beat around the bush. We'll have a better angle of approaching God. He already knows where you're at anyway. Why beat around the bush? Just tell God, just like David did, exactly what you're faced with and what you're going through. And he's big enough to care for every problem that you've got this morning. In fact, 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, casting all, not some of you care. Not a few of them. Peter said you cast all you care upon him for he care for you. Carrying your worries, your stress, your daily struggles all by yourself shows that you've not trusted God to fully care for you in your life. So just turn it all over to the Lord. And again, don't lean to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and lift him up. Best place you can go to today is to the feet of Jesus and lean upon him and trust in him. May God bless you today. We got good news last Sunday back. One had heard the message, one had been saved, and I was telling Gary and Stan this morning that that's worth every effort that we'll ever put forth here on these Sunday mornings. You, you, can't, you can't put a price tag on that. Man, that's what it's all about. I want to encourage you from Admiral Friel Baptist Church to keep on keeping on. 
But I want to share a message to a lost and a dying world that God loves you. Jesus died for you, and the Lord won't save you. And if you're out there today and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, why don't you lean upon Him? Right. Trust in Him. Give your heart to Him. Folks, it'll be the best decision you ever made in life. I've done several weddings across through my years of ministry. And I made up my own wedding vows. And I took them from some from this one, some from that one, some from another one. And I put them all together and I formed mine. A fellow asked me one day, he said, where did you get that? I said, it's part of this, part of that, part of the other. And it all come together to make one. But in those wedding vows, it says that marriage is the most important decision that you'll make in life. I changed that. He said, why did you do that, preacher? I put this. Marriage is one of the most important decisions you'll make in life. But the most important one is what you do with Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing tops that. God bless you. Edward Church. Keep on keeping on. Hang in there. Uh, God will get us through. God will get us through. If you're not a member here at Adwell Church, or you don't attend here at Adwell Free Baptist Church, and you're listening today, let me be an encouragement to you as a child of God. Keep on keeping on. God still knows what you're going through. God's still in control. If you don't know Christ, get saved. Get saved. Turn your life over to Him. And let it come into your heart. That's right. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity this morning to be able to have church by the way of Facebook. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage the folks from Adwolf Church. You encourage other Christians that are listening today and others that may listen throughout this week to this message. But, Lord, that you would help us all collectively as the body of Christ just to do what David advises us to do, trust in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Just day by day to allow you to be in charge of everything in and around our lives. So encourage us and help us. And then for the lost, I pray right now that somebody in the sound of my voice, whether it be this morning, while at the 11 o'clock hour, or sometime during this week, if they turn tune into Facebook, and they look at Facebook, and they get this message, that Lord, somebody, somewhere, surrender their life to Christ. Bless these great men that have come for Gary and stay and help them, help their families, and Lord, put a hedge about us and protect us and help us all as a church. We need you help. We acknowledge that in Jesus' name. May God bless you. May you have a good furtherance of this day. May you have a good week this week in the Lord. God bless you. It's our prayers.